Hi and welcome back to Oncology for Medical Students. This section of videos is on oncological emergencies, with this video focusing on spinal cord compression. Spinal cord compression can be caused by anything that puts pressure on your spinal cord. As many of you are probably aware, the function of the spinal cord is to transfer electrical messages back and forth from the brain to the rest of the body. The spinal cord is particularly important for movement and sensation. The spinal cord is protected by a stack of bones called vertebrae that form what is known as the spinal column. Spinal nerves come out from the spinal cord through gaps in the vertebrae and carry signals to and from the muscles and tissues at every level of the body. Each vertebrae in the spinal column has a different name according to where it is. There are seven cervical vertebrae in the neck, 12 thoracic in the chest region, five lumbar in the lower back, five sacral and four coccygeal. The sacral and coccygeal vertebrae are fused and usually referred to simply as the sacral bone and the coccyx. The nerves that come from the spinal cord are named after the levels at which they leave the spinal column. These are C1 to 8, T1 to 12, L1 to 5 and S1 to 5. The spinal cord ends around the level of L1 to 2, after which there is a bundle of nerves that are known as the cord requina, which means horse's tail. Compression of the spinal cord can happen at any level, from the top of the neck to the lower back at L1 to 2, where the cord ends. Compression below this level is technically known as corda equina syndrome, as compression is not on the spinal cord, rather the nerves that form the cord equina, and this has a different constellation of symptoms. The spinal cord is protected by the bones that surround it. These are vertebrae anteriorly, the pedicles laterally, the laminae and spinous processes posteriorly. Inside the spinal canal, the spinal cord is protected by three layers of meninges. These are the thick dura on the outside, the arachnoid just inside this, and the pier which covers the cord itself. The space in blue between the arachnoid and pier is known as the subarachnoid space, and this is where cerebrospinal fluid is contained. The thickest layer, the dura, is often referred to as forming the thecal sac. Outside of this is what is known as the epidural space, in which lies fat and veins. At each level, the spinal nerves leave lateral to the spinal cord and posterior to the vertebral body. The most common cause of compression is actually osteoarthritis, caused by wear and tear of the vertebral bones over time. Other causes, including herniation or bulging discs between the vertebrae, rheumatoid arthritis, spinal injury or deformities or infections and abscesses. Tumours are also a common cause, which will be obviously the focus of this video. Spinal cord compression is common in people with cancer. It's estimated from post-mortem studies after death that around 5% of people who have died from cancer have some degree of spinal cord compression. Around 90% of tumours causing spinal cord compression arise in the vertebrae. 80% of these involve the vertebral body, meaning the anterior part of the cord is most often affected initially. When tumours grow in the vertebral bones, they can invade the epidural space and compress the thecal sac. If it carries on growing, it will compress the veins and arteries, which leads to cell death by ischemia or lack of oxygen. Any type of cancer that spreads to the spinal bones or nearby tissue can cause spinal cord compression. However, those that have a tendency to metastasize or spread to these places are more common causes. They're commonly seen in patients with lung cancer, breast cancer and myeloma, as well as lymphoma and prostate cancer. In children, tumours that cause spinal cord compression are mostly sarcomas, which are a type of connective tissue tumour and neuroblastomas which are nervous system tumours. 60% of these tumours are located in the thoracic spine, 30% in the lumbar and sacral and 10 cervical. These are roughly equivalent to the relative mass of bone in each segment, suggesting that there's no preference for any particular region of the spine. In terms of symptoms, people experience most commonly back pain. This usually precedes other symptoms by an average of around seven weeks. Unfortunately, this often leads to a delay in diagnosis. The pain is usually localised, gradually increasing, worse on straining or coughing or when opening bowels, and often severe to the point where it disturbs sleep. Weakness tends to follow an upper motor neuron pattern. So signs you might notice are 
increase muscle tone or increase reflexes as well as weakness. In quadriquina syndrome, where the nerves in the quadriquina are compressed, you get a different pattern of symptoms which tend to follow a lower motor neuron pattern, which might be weakness, decreased reflexes and decreased tone. Sensory loss is another symptom that might be experienced. It's less common, but patients might experience sensory loss. Urinary retention and constipation are also symptoms that patients might possibly experience. But these kind of bowel and bladder disturbances tend to be more typical of quadriquina syndrome. So in terms of diagnosis, if there's significant clinical suspicion of a spinal cord compression, then imaging is needed to confirm the diagnosis. MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is best for views of the spinal cord and adjacent bone and soft tissues. And here we can see an example with tumours at many levels of the spine compressing the spinal cord. In terms of treatment, Treatment of spinal metastases is almost always palliative, as the presence of spinal metastases is indicative of advanced metastatic and usually incurable cancer. It's important to know that the most significant predictor of outcome is pre-surgical neurological status, which simply put means that early treatment before the neurological problems occur leads to better outcomes. Initial measures immediately after diagnosis include practical measures. The patient should lie flat and their spinal alignment should be kept neutral. This includes when they're moved. They should be log rolled to avoid bending of the spine. Regular rolling is important to prevent the development of things like pressure damage and ulcers. If the damage is above the level of the sixth thoracic vertebrae, something called neurogenic shock can occur. To put things simply, the sympathetic nervous system is disturbed, leading to the loss of tone in the blood vessels and vasodilation. This causes pooling of blood in the peripheries, and if this blood isn't getting back to the heart, it leads to a drop in blood pressure. Compression stockings or devices can be useful in trying to encourage blood flow in the venous system back up to the heart. In terms of medical treatments, the mainstay is high-dose steroids, which will reduce pain and swelling. This is usually in the form of dexamethasone, with a dose of something around 16 milligrams. More definitive treatment is in the form of surgery and radiotherapy. There's a fair amount of argument between those who are in support of either the use of surgery alone, radiotherapy alone, or a combination of both. Radiotherapy alone might be useful in tumours that are particularly sensitive, often things like small cell lung cancer, metastases or myeloma, or in patients who cannot have surgery due to other medical problems creating too much risk. It can also be used for tumours that are not causing neurological problems or spinal instability. Surgery involves decompressing the spinal cord by moving part of the vertebrae, the lamina, and then stabilising the spine by internal fixation with screws and plates. It's risky, and common complications include infections, spinal instability, or cord damage. It's only really suitable if a patient hasn't already lost neurological function, most importantly, their ability to walk, as if they have, they're unlikely to regain it even with surgery. Patients in this condition will only have surgery if stabilising the spine is required for pain management. So, in summary, malignant spinal cord compression is most often caused by spinal metastases to the vertebrae that cause compression of the spinal cord. Most common symptoms include back pain, and also things like sensory loss, weakness, and bladder and bowel dysfunction. Diagnosis is made by MRI scanning, and treatment involves initially lying flat, giving steroids to reduce pain and swelling, before a definitive therapy such as radiotherapy, particularly in people who don't have spinal instability or aren't fit enough to undergo surgery, or surgery in patients who have spinal instability but haven't already developed serious neurological complications. Thanks for listening and do keep checking the channel for more videos on oncological emergencies coming soon.